Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, the Engelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. Civility and its demise. If you watch this broadcast closely, you'll hear my guests and yours truly invoke, and sometimes romanticize, the aspiration of civil discourse. In fact, recently, the Washington Post profiled us as an outlier committed to that perhaps antiquated notion that civility is still achievable. And in their inquiry here, practitioners across all disciplines envision its application. In facilitating open dialogue, we try to heed the words of RFK. Some men see things as they are, uncivil, and ask why. We dream of things that never were and ask why not, and why not civility? With fervent interest, that's why I asked Keith Bybee to join me today. Author of the essential new volume, How Civility Works, Bybee is Judiciary Studies Professor at the Syracuse University College of Law and Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs. Bybee argues, as the New York Times chronicled in its review, How to Be Civil in an Uncivil World, that it's naive to imagine we can somehow transcend our clashing sets of values and miraculously agree on what counts as acceptable behavior or tolerable opinion. We have for decades endeavored to find common ground, and today we ask how, in fact, does civility work? And can it work in our politics in 2017, and has it ever worked? in our politics. Well, first of all, thanks for having me here. Uh, I think if we define civility as a baseline of respect that we owe one another in public life, really just sort of the bare minimum, many people would agree that the past uh, two years have really tested that baseline. Many people would say that the presidential election of 2016 uh, and our current politics represent the kind of crisis of civility uh, but I think it's important to place that in context in a couple of ways. One important way is that many breaches of civility that we observe, particularly in politics, are strategic violations of civility. They're political tactics. And strategic incivility presupposes that there's some consensus about appropriate behavior, some consensus on this baseline of respect we owe one another in public life violates that consensus for the sake of generating attention and then through a kind of political jujitsu redirects that outrage towards an issue uh, or a person who wants the publicity. That kind of strategic incivility, although it's clearly a breach of uh, good behavior and decorum, is itself counting on the existence of civility and so it's not a threat to civility as a whole. So I think one thing we have to recognize is that many of the uh, outrages uh, that people observe in public life uh, are not themselves indicative of a crisis of civility. Uh, rather, they're uh, provocateurs uh, seeking to advance particular agendas or personal objectives through outrageous behavior, but ultimately are not globally threatening our understanding of civil behavior. Um, which is not to say that there aren't people who think, uh, with some good reason, that there is a crisis in civility. A crisis in civility or a crisis of incivility, depending upon that's, how, how that's you look right. at it. I mean, when you talk about the exploitation of incivility in the political realm, I think that you know, we emulate, or in many cases seek to emulate, our parents, monkey see, monkey do, yes. our presidents, our popes, our rabbis, our imams, when you write, instead civility itself is a subject of a political struggle and debate. Um, I wonder to what extent 
when you delineated between public and private at mm -hmm. the outset of your answer, mm -hmm. that's not the case anymore. We have a crisis privately and publicly. Right. Right. Well, you know, and it is true, if we look outside this election, which seems to have lasted forever, right, <laughs> and it left us with a kind of politics that we're still uh, grappling with, people have complained broadly about incivility uh, in American public life. Our politics, even beyond any given election, are devoted towards destruction of one's opponents. Um, our media sensationalizes conflicts and relentlessly stokes animosities. Um, even in the workplace, people encounter various forms of boorish behavior. And of course, on the internet, comment sections on web pages and social media, you see all sorts of insult and invective. And so there seems to be this ubiquity of incivility. Uh, and you might say, well, where does that, that come from? Well, typically, we learn civility at home, right? There's it's the original homeschooling uh, is in uh, our understanding of appropriate behavior. And historically, civility was a matter not just of imitating some elite, it was imitating one elite. Uh, it was in the princely courts of medieval Europe that uh, first gave rise to various forms of, of civil or polite behavior. I think one thing that's happened in our society, although it's true we all have a model we're imitating, there are multiple and conflicting models of behavior to imitate. Uh, we live in a highly diverse and uh, incredibly dynamic society um, that's subject to uh, enormous change and growth. Uh, it's changed tremendously since uh, the 13 colonies began and in order, uh, you know, inherited a rank-ordered society from England um, uh, to what we have today, a country of over 330 million. And even though you learn civility at home, uh, we learn it in different ways. And even if there's some shared set of principles of decorum uh, that we might ascribe to many or most families in the United States, when it comes to questions of application, uh, we all differ. So I, we live in a society, I think, where um, many of us go out into public life with an understanding of what you know, behavior is required or appropriate or expected, uh, but we constantly encounter people who are behaving differently. Now, are those people being rude in some kind of abstract sense? I would argue no. What they're doing is following their own notion of appropriate behavior. So the crisis in civility that we experience um, beyond any given electoral campaign is a result not of the absence of civility, but because of its excess. It's the right, profusion you, you, of civility. You point out that there is a kind of invisible excess, if you will, in order to operate a society where we're not you know, macheting each other on the street right. in order to operate a stock market, to have traders who are alive, not bludgeoned right, right. at the end of the day. Right, 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 right. So there is some functionality here. Yes. That being said, I, I question whether or not there is a notion to people of civility today. And if you're not accepting that there is a quality of decorum, and I don't really view it through the lens of, of decorum as much as decency, but not even as much decency as the juices, the political capital or social capital right. that have to fuel our, the continuity of humanity. Right. And, and, and you know, there's been, uh, at this point, generations of studies that have documented decline in social capital in the United States, right? Uh, Robert Putnam's Bowling Alone was probably the, the splashiest example of that. Um, but there are many instances where we can find that people are, are no longer engaging in community activity, uh, many people now fully privatize their leisure time. So rather than going out into the community and whether it's uh, volunteering or participating in some kind of fraternal organization or being in a sports league, they're at home uh, watching TV um, or doing some, pursuing some other uh, private activity at home. But I think there's a difference between social capital and uh, the role that civility plays. Uh, I think civility has a kind of core function, uh, which is it's communicative. It's a means of conveying to other people your goodness and your decency. Right? When we lived in a fully face-to-face -face community where everybody knew each other. Um, they know who you are, Alexander, right? They know where you come from. They know your parents. Uh, they know all about you, right? Uh, but we live in a um, society of strangers in many respects. Uh, but strangers that are dependent upon one another. 
There are eight million people uh, in the city of New York, and we need to, we're not gonna get to know all each other very well, but we need to find means of productively interacting and coordinating our behavior. And one mechanism of that is an easily available, easily administrable means of quickly conveying to another person that you're a safe, trusted partner for interaction. So that kind of basic communication, communication that I'm going to respect you and, and reciprocally I'd like you to respect me, is I think a little bit different than the kind of social capital uh, bonding within a community where we gather together to you know, build a barn for our neighbor or... Keith, I may be extrapolating. It, yes. it, may, be, it may be that there is some definitional agreement at, at the core, but to me, the prerequisite for any kind of progress, the prerequisite for a civilization, if you look at the origin of the word, yeah. is behaving in a way or practicing civility in some right. way. I've talked about the notion of disagreeably agreeing in our politics as a necessity today amid the kind of privatized leisure and increasingly privatized silo of information absorption and gathering. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how does civility work in discourse? Uh, not necessarily the president's discourse, mm -hmm. but in day-to-day -day discourse, neighborly discourse. Right. So um, let me say two things. Uh, one is I think that we have a case between you and I here of heated agreement, <laughs> right? So I, I don't think that civility is uh, uh, independent of or unrelated to uh, these other, uh, you know, kind of political solidarity community activities that you've described, right? Um, I guess what I would say, uh, secondly, is that um, if we look at civility historically, we can see that civility is compatible with very different kinds of societies. You can have uh, rigid hierarchical societies, non-democratic societies uh, that have well-established uh, modes of uh, civility, a shared understanding of appropriate behavior. Um, and in the United States, it's not as if we've had a single model of civility that we've just sort of either lived up to or failed to live up to over time. As you mentioned, my conception of, uh, of civility uh, is fundamentally political. I don't see civility uh, as an objective standard that's outside of public life that we can appeal to uh, in the course of our disputes as a way of restraining and rendering more peaceful our interactions. On the contrary, I think civility is determined through our conflicts. And let me give you a couple of examples of that. Um, if we look at the civil rights movement in the 20th century, uh, we associate the civil rights movement with uh, important legislative outcomes, Civil Rights Act of 1964, Voting Rights Act of 1965. We associate the civil rights movement with important Supreme Court decisions, you know, Brown versus Board of Education, for example, desegregating uh, schools throughout the United States. Uh, but the civil rights movement was also a social struggle. The civil rights movement was also a dispute over what would count as civil behavior. Uh, Jim Crow laws, uh, which existed throughout the states of the former Confederacy, um, were surrounded and sustained by a well-developed racial etiquette. And this racial etiquette uh, had uh, rules of appropriate behavior that when complied with, uh, enacted a racial hierarchy. And civil rights activist Martin Luther, Martin Luther King. In other words, civility to the descendants of the Confederacy and <sighs> propriety Absolutely. as I mean, being synonymous with that. Let's civil rights. Right. right. So, 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 no, in this, um, <laughs> right, right. And so you have the dispute is within the family of civility. The entire right. dis argument is not who's civil and who's rude, right? who's behaving well and who's behaving in an outrageous, unacceptable, unacceptably rude behavior. Um, rather, it's a question of what's going to count as the rule of civility for our society. And if you read Letter from Birmingham Jail by uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., he talks about this racial etiquette. And he talks about his objective, which is to make sure that African Americans, simply given the same uh, degree of respect, uh, as white people. Now, 
Um, degrees of respect, uh, often it's a matter of showing, is very simple, right? It, it doesn't require um, running into a burning building and saving people who are trapped there. Uh, it's a matter of small modifications in speech and behavior. But these small modifications are freighted with meaning. As I said, they, they communicate something. Right? The way you and I, sitting on either sides right. of this table, having this conversation, and you haven't lunged at me I, yet <laughs> well, <laughs> at all. Right? I, I mean, there's, I'm there's very interested you brought up civil, civil rights. We're talking about the origin of civility as in civilization and civil rights. To me, that's important because yeah. civil is not sufficiently distinguished between civil, what's civil and what's civic. And there are a lot of institutions for civic education. Yeah. But civic is municipal. Yes. Civil can and should be more normative, no? I mean, it's... Right. You know, and I think that it is true if you look at civics education, which is undergoing a little bit of a renaissance. Uh, I mean, there was a, a real concern about lack of civil education in K through 12 uh, settings. And so there's more civics education now filtering its way through the school districts than existed before. But much of that is organized around information, right? How does a bill become a law? What are the three branches of government, right? We just sort of, what's the operator's manual, right? Um, but there's a lot less of it, if any of it, about how to conduct yourself in public life in a way that would communicate your respect for others and reciprocally invite respect for yourself. I mean, some of the oldest uh, rules of our politics, of course, we think about the Constitution, but think about what the House of Representatives did and as soon as it convened in 1789. It passed rules of order, rules of decorum, which are one of the oldest forms of civility in American public life. It's one of the first actions of a federal government, right? And those rules uh, tried to set up a situation that would achieve exactly what you've pointed towards, which is in a context of, of perpetual disagreement, uh, you assume that everybody comes to that argument uh, as actors of good faith. You don't address them personally. You address them as representatives of the state from which they're elected. You actually, in the House, don't speak to each other even. You address the speaker. Right? So there, it, it seems kind of formal and maybe in some ways antique and faintly ridiculous, but civility in the sense that you're describing uh, is something that grew up with our civil life and our civic activity. You can't separate the two in that sense. Um, I think it's... But I, unfortunately, I think they are being separated. Well, and, and I think, right. you know, one of the origins of that separation, I think, frankly, is the alienation of people of faith in the public square. Uh, it would be my contention that we would have more civility right now if civic education hadn't alienated people of the book. Right. If, and if, you know, because that is a huge share of what did underpin American origins. Well, and you have to, I mean, at the root of uh, civil interaction, if you think of civility, not only, as I said, as this baseline of respect, but as a means of communication, uh, a presumption that's embedded within that set of definitions is the idea that I care about communicating with you and you care about communicating with me. If you write off some segment of the community, if you um, gerrymander uh, the boundaries of polite society in such a way that groups are cut out, uh, then they don't even warrant uh, civil treatment. Uh, right. Right? They're, they're kind of outside of this uh, communicative exchange. and. Um, that kind of boundary drawing actually happens all the time. Uh, we tend to forget it sometimes because it's embedded within our history, but we look at the struggle that um, female activists had in the early 19th century. Uh, you know, for a woman to appear alone in public in the early 19th century was to invite reprobrium. I mean, this was not something that was considered to be a good idea. And for a woman to be uh, alone in a public space advocating her interests, uh, speaking about politics, could be seen as positively scandalous. So we needed to, and, and we had as a result of political struggle and slow social change, uh, an alteration in the rules of civility and the understanding of civility that would allow us to accept women as uh, advocates, women as having interests that they could advocate independently and act in politically to advance them. Um, so there was a way in which women, of course, are part of uh, the community, right? Uh, 
but, uh, and they had a role in public life, but giving them uh, equal standing was the result of political debate and dispute. Uh, the drawing of the lines and the relationship of different people to one another within um, a, a civil society in the way we're discussing it, which is one that is characterized by civility, uh, is itself something that happens as a result of people advocating, people modeling uh, and advancing the sort of civility that they think ought to prevail in their own speech and action. My point is just that you're not going to preserve civil society or preserve civil rights if you don't have institutions devoted not to civic education but civil right. civility and civil education. But, but hear me out here. Yeah. I would also contend that the most uncivil condition of contemporary public life is in inequity. I view it through that lens, mm -hmm. and I think that this populist surge is in response to conditions that are uncivil on the ground. Am I wrong? Uh, it is indecent right. to let the kind of wealth be carried by so few and also not conducive to advancing civilization. I don't know if you see it through that lens. I, I personally agree, uh, but I would say that um, as a historical and as a contemporary matter, uh, that people don't necessarily themselves define civility as requiring this foundation of equality. Uh, as I mentioned before, civility has been present in, in highly inegalitarian uh, societies. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we, we've seen before uh, uh, people arguing against civility. In fact, there's a long tradition of people criticizing civility because of its in egalitarian foundation. Uh, there is a tradition of rejecting um, what I call in the book repressive civility, right? right? And so, it, you know, in some ways we can, we often think of, well, civility uh, confronts as its opponent incivility, right? This is the dynamic here, and, and the question is which side is going to prevail, and um, how do we advance civility against those who, um, who just don't know the value of civility or what it is, how do we educate them? That's almost the, the you know, social studies, civic education uh, conversation. But, you know, there's an alternative to civility, which is uh, often presented as just being against civility of any kind, uh, and you might call that free speech society. And John Stuart Mill, in his classic essay on liberty, was a great critic of civility because he thought claims about how people ought to behave uh, were used in ways to marginalize dissenters. He thought what we ought to do instead is allow for um, you know, ro robust, uninhibited, wide open discussion of every conceivable idea. Uh, that kind of free speech and open contention would allow us to um, separate partial truths uh, from outright fabrications and identify whole truths, even things we already know to be true, it would give us a more vital grasp uh, of these truths. Um, and it would also allow more broadly, not just a pursuit of truth in public debate, but uh, opportunities for the flourishing of human nature. And as Mill said, we are not machines. Uh, humans instead are like trees, and they're meant to grow on all sides. Uh, as a result of the inner forces that make them living beings. So we have to allow for this wide degree of experimentation in living. So all of this celebration of individual liberty and um, say what you want, uh, just go out there and be free, uh, has historically been arrayed against civilities of all kind. And they point to civility and say, yes, civility is what protects inequality because it assigns people certain roles, certain stations. Uh, and to attack uh, underlying inequalities, we need to dispense with the sense that there's some kind of appropriate behavior. And instead, we need to just argue. We need to stop so treating. So is that counterpoint, you think, the pervasive wind in this country? Uh, I, I think that there's a uh, I think it, there's a robust tradition of free speech in the United States. Uh, it's ebbed and flowed, but I think you find many uh, critics of civility today who would invoke uh, freedom of expression as their preferred mode of public interaction.
Um, I think they're wrong, actually, to dispense with, in, with civility and talk of civility. And the reason why is because I think civility actually serves uh, the great goals and the actual everyday practice of free speech. You know, you think about uh, Mill's conception of free speech or anybody who talks about, um, you know, free trade and ideas, marketplace of ideas, is um, leading to a competition among competing points of view. Ultimately, we arrive at the truth. Competition works because there are winners and losers. And in a free marketplace of ideas, uh, we suppose that a lot of people are going to make failed rhetorical sallies. Right? They're going to argue a point of view. They're going to be yeah. rejected. Uh, what civility allows us to do is to still communicate to other people, hey, look, I'm a good and decent person. Maybe my ideas you reject. Right? Maybe you, you think I don't have the right way forward on how to reform health care or the right way forward on how to um, you know, deal with infrastructure problems in the United States. Uh, but you don't attack me personally. Right? Civility, I think, can be, uh, and when properly constructed and acted, is uh, a foundation for robust exchange, free exchange of ideas. Uh, civility can be constructed in repressive ways. Right. Just as speech can be constructed in Turns repressive out, ways, yes. right? I mean, there's the rub. But when yeah. you don't have free speech, it goes back to your beginning point about the exploitation of rhetoric in the political theater, in which case this is not in pursuit of some larger truth. This is not in pursuit of some exchange of ideas. Right. This is in pursuit of the execution and realization of, an, of a political agenda. And I would say similarly. When people critique civility as being uh, repressive and restrictive, that's not an argument uh, to dispense with civility. Uh, rather, what we need is more civility, more talk about civility. What is the closest way we can capture some consensus around civility today? Uh, well, we can begin today. Any action or interaction in public is an occasion for civility. I encourage everybody, the next time they sit down to eat, consider that to be an occasion for civil interaction. And, and privately, too? And, 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 and privately, too. Anytime you're not alone is an opportunity to engage in civil interaction. Keith Bybee, how civility works. We tried to demonstrate today. Hopefully we succeeded. Thanks for having me. And thanks to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time for a thoughtful and civil excursion into the world of ideas. Until then, keep an open mind. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash open mind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other interviews. And do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, the Angelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, with special thanks to the Schumann Media Center for additional support, and to the corporate community Mutual of America.